Welcome everyone to an introduction to System Dynamics with Vensim. First, a few preliminaries. I'll show you where to get the uh, materials and the software. You want to visit the uh, Vensim conference page. There you'll find uh, a software link. This will either take you to the Vensim PLE download page uh, or you can use the form to request a trial license for Vensim DSS, the advanced version with arrays and scripting and a dynamic link library and so forth. Uh, but everything in this uh, workshop can be done with PLE. Um, and you can also use, uh, if you already have one, an earlier version of Vensim, PLE Plus, Pro, or DSS but do expect some minor interface differences. Uh, the other thing you want to grab are the workshop materials, which are in a OneDrive shared folder. And uh, there you'll find a uh, zip file containing finished models that are the endpoints uh, for what we're going to do, as well as copies of the slides and uh, you may find the models useful to peek into to look ahead and decide what to do in your own hands-on copy. Once you download that zip folder, uh, you should save it in a uh, your documents folder or some other convenient place that isn't locked down by the operating system and unzip it so you can see all the contents. In there, Again, you'll find a copy of the slides and materials, and the exercise that we're going to do is in a folder called EX Customer Base. And if you peek inside of that, uh, you'll see uh, Customer Base 0 ABC, as well as a couple of sandbox models for experimentation. There's a lot to cover in the field of system dynamics, and we obviously can't tackle it all in an hour and a half. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the mechanics of working with the software uh, so that you'll then be able to go on and learn system dynamics on your own. We'll focus uh, primarily on diagramming, writing equations, and running the model and managing your output. Uh, we won't talk about advanced features like data, but there are some other videos on vensim.com that cover those topics. Along the way, I will talk a little bit about stocks, flows, feedback, nonlinearity, uh, bounded rationality, and other aspects of system dynamics, but we won't really uh, get into that. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about skills for debugging and testing uh, your models, uh, though that's just a small part of the system dynamics process of getting information out of people and into the model and drawing conclusions from it and then turning those conclusions or insights into uh, actionable uh, findings that are convincing to your stakeholders. Um, so lots of interesting things to cover here. We're going to start by building a ridiculously simple model uh, just to kind of get the mechanics and then we will add layers to the onion so to speak um, and actually this is a great way to proceed when you're modeling in general never underestimate uh, a one stock one flow model uh, the dynamics of accumulation can provide key insights um, and it, as uh, Jim Hines has, says in his rules of consulting, always be done. So if you build a model that is manageable in scale uh, and then add to it kind of one loop at a time, um, you won't find yourself in the trap of having lots of pretty but non-functional structure the night before you have to make a key presentation. Okay, uh, I'm going to assume you've installed Vensim and unzipped the uh, folder someplace uh, and fired up Vensim. And normally Vensim will open to a model that you've worked with before, uh, but if you haven't, it'll open to a blank, empty model. 
Um, so uh, just to orient you, this big white space is the sketch or the diagram for the model you're going to build. Uh, and then you have some uh, menu up top, a toolbar with the usual kind of cut, copy, paste, plus a number of tools for running the model that we'll see in, in a moment. And then a set of uh, control panels and then the next toolbar is a bunch of tools for working on the diagram. Down at the bottom are a bunch of properties for diagram elements like setting the font and color and uh, creating multiple views. And then finally on the left here is what we call the analysis toolbar. Uh, again, we'll work with these in a couple of minutes. These are for inspecting the structure of your model, plotting graphs of its behavior, or tables, um, and so forth. So, uh, if you don't have a uh, clean model here, you can close the one you've got and say uh, new model. And when you create a new model, first thing it asks you is well, actually one of the first things you'd want to ask people for whom you're doing the project, which is what's the time horizon and time granularity or time step for the model. For the moment, I'm just gonna leave these alone. We're building a model of competitive dynamics uh, or I guess more loosely market dynamics for a firm. Uh, so 100 months is a little less than 10 years. Uh, which is not an unreasonable time scale for the evolution of a market. Uh, normally, I would have some more problem-specific information to base this decision on. Um, the time step does not need to be one month or one of anything. Uh, sometimes that's convenient, but really the time step should be set according to the shortest feature or the fastest dynamics that you expect to take place in your model. That's not always obvious up front, um, but uh, I'm thinking that we probably aren't interested in dynamics faster than a month for a firm, so I'm also going to leave that alone. Later on, I can do some sensitivity testing and cut it in half and see if it makes any difference. So I'm just going to say OK here. And now we have our blank canvas. Uh, so just to rem remember what we're going to do, we're modeling the customer base of a firm. So the firm is attracting customers to adopt its product. And later, we'll handle some other processes of people leaving. Um, yeah, and so. Uh, we want a stock of customers in the customer base and a flow of the adoption rate. So to place the stock, I'm going to go to the toolbar here and grab the stock tool. And I'm just going to click somewhere in the white space and I'll call this uh, customer base. Um, so you might think of this as the stock of people who own a particular brand of phone or printer or car or something like that. Um, so there's my customer base. And now I want an inflow of uh, customers adopting the product. Um, so I'm going to grab the flow tool. And... I want this to be an inflow, so I'm going to click in the white space, and you'll notice I get a cloud. So the cloud indicates that we don't care where this flow comes from, at least for the moment. Always good to challenge the boundaries of your model later on. Uh, so I clicked once to get the cloud, and now I'm going to click again inside the stock, and I'm just getting a uh, nuisance prompt here. Uh, do you want to save the sketch? I probably should have done this up front. So I'm going to save this uh, in the same location that I'm working in. 
and uh, I'll give it a name. I'll call this uh, customers zero. Um, don't save over the uh, version that's provided for you in the zip file. Um, so uh, that interrupted my workflow. So what I'm going to do is just say undo to get rid of that flow pipe and then I'll recreate it. So I can click now, the cloud actually didn't go away. I can click on the cloud, click on the stock. Uh, and now I need to give this a name. Um, you want a name for flows that indicates that they're sort of actions that are changing the stocks. So something with a verb sense to it. Uh, so one convention would be to call this the adoption rate. Another possibility is to call it adopting. I actually kind of like that convention just because it's a little more brief. Uh, and sometimes people confuse the rate with a percentage rate of change or something like that. Um, so this is pretty clear. Uh, so um, suppose I uh, didn't like what I'd done. I could grab the trash can here and delete it. And I'll do that uh, just for the purposes of redoing that flow without the interruption of the, the uh, save dialog. So I click in the white space, click in the stock, and give it a name. Uh, okay, um, so now we have the structure for a very simple model which says that customers are the accumulation of the inflow of people adopting the product. So uh, let's write a couple of equations. Um, but actually, uh, before we do, let's think about what, one question, which is the equation editor is going to ask us what units we want to supply for this. So the customer base is full of people, uh, or it could be companies or something like that. But let's, let's call it people. So the flow of adopting is going to be in people per time, and in this case, time is months, so this is going to be people per month. Um, so this is one rule of thumb that uh, you can rely on. Whatever units a stock has, like people, the flows associated with that stock are going to have the stock unit divided by time. So people, people per time. Uh, so let's go ahead and write these equations. Um, so first, adopting. And I went a little fast there. I grabbed the equation tool. I click on adopting. And I get the equation editor. Um, so uh, we were just talking about units. I can set units here. There's a drop-down menu, but it's not populated yet because I haven't started using units. So I'm just going to type people per month. In the future, that'll be available to me in the drop-down. It'll collect the units I've been using. And uh, let's just say that arbitrarily there are 100 people per month adopting the product. Um, that's it. So you'll notice that uh, when I selected the equation tool, things that needed uh, definition were highlighted. And now that I've defined adopting, it's not highlighted. So we'll move on to the customer base. I'll click that. And the units here, so you'll notice uh, people per month are there, but we just want people. And a stock equation actually has two parts. There's the dynamic piece, so it's the integral, that's what INTEG stands for, of adopting. And it's filled that in based on how I drew the diagram. Uh, if you change the direction of arrows or add and remove arrows, uh, sometimes you can confuse Vensim about which direction you intend, but normally it'll get this right. Uh, the second thing that you need for a stock is the initial state, or where does it start? So we're accumulating adoptions, and the question is that when we start the model at time zero, how many people were in there? Um, so I'm just going to 
keep it simple and say that there were no customers prior to the start of the model. Set that to zero. Uh, okay. Now, uh, hopefully we're good to go, but we should probably do a couple of checks before we run the model. Um, first check is units. Uh, so you can either go to the model menu and say units check, or you can use the units check tool over here in the analysis toolbar. So I'm going to hit units check and it's happy. Uh, later we'll make a units error uh, just to show you what that looks like. Um, second check actually happens automatically if we simulate the model. Uh, so let's do that. Um, and I'm going to give the run a more descriptive name. So the default run name in this field here in the title bar is current. Um, but I'll call it customer zero. Normally, once the model's more mature, I'll uh, give it a name like this is the base run or the policy run or the high market share run or what you know something descriptive of the experiment that you're performing. Um, but since this is very preliminary, I'll just sort of name it according to the model name. I'll hit save, and I'm going to hit the green triangle here to run, the sort of a play button. And uh, you may have seen a dialog flicker there if it was fast enough to capture, but the model is so simple it ran almost instantaneously. So uh, where's our stuff? Um, well, there are couple of possibilities. Uh, one is if you hit the B key, you'll notice the behavior gets superimposed over the stock. You can toggle that on and off for a quick way to see what's going on. Um, but normally what we're going to do uh, is we're going to uh, put some, uh, we're going to use the uh, output from the analysis tools. So I can click on the uh, customer base and click on the graph tool to pop up a graph. So you see customers rising at 100 per month here. After 100 months, we have 10,000 people as we'd expect. And you can also plot adopting. That's not gonna be very exciting. Uh, and you can look at a table of the output, uh, either across or transposed. Um, and uh, so, that, so that's where our run went. Um, let's do another one uh, just for fun. Uh, I'm gonna say, I call this uh, adopting 200. And we're just going to double the adoption rate. So to do that, instead of hitting the run button right away, I'm going to launch the simulation control. And that brings up a dialog that we could use to uh, make some changes on the fly. Um, but also you'll notice that adopting is now highlighted in kind of a turquoise. And that's because it's a constant or a parameter that we could change. So instead of 100, I could run it with 200 and hit the simulate button. So now if I plot a uh, customer base chart, I can see both plots. Um, one other thing you might notice is that each time we run the sketch switches to this locked mode, uh, which just makes it easier to browse around and click things without inadvertently editing the model. If you want to go back to moving things around and editing the model, uh, just grab the uh, move tool, the one with the finger, or one of the other uh, editing oriented tools. So each time we run the model, you're getting an additional uh, data set containing the output. So where's that going? Well, I'm gonna move up here to the uh, control panel 
and open that and you'll see a uh, window docked over here on the right side. Uh, this is the data set manager and there are several other tabs here for graphs and variable lists and things like that that we may look at later. Uh, but this is the one you'll use the most. The data set manager lists the output files that you've created from your runs. These are VDFX files, so Vensim data something or other. Uh, and so you'll see them here with the names that they got from the field in the title bar. And you can load and unload them. So for example, if I want to uh, not look at customer zero, uh, but just adopting 200, I can uh, show just the one. Another way to do that is to uh, uncheck it on the uh, chart um, for kind of a volatile change. Uh, so the data set manager lets you keep track of all the scenarios that you've run. And once you have multiples in here, you can use another analysis tool, the runs compare tool, to see what the difference is. So the difference between these two is that the adopting constant was uh, 101 and 200 in the other, as we'd expect. Um, okay, uh, to make this a little more interactive, one thing we might do is uh, make some of the behavior visible. You know, in this model, you can really kind of keep this in your head, but uh, we might as well start anticipating a time when this is more complex. So I'm going to go to the uh, input-output controls. You can place sliders, uh, but we don't really need those yet. Uh, or you can... Um, place a workbench tool. So what that means, I'm going to go ahead and select that. You'll see I've got a little graph icon on the cursor. I'm going to click here and I'm going to use the graph tool. So that's uh, this one over here in the toolbar. And for a variable, uh, I can either type customer base because I can see it right here or I can just select it from a menu. And you'll see now I've got a uh, pinned chart of the uh, behavior of the customer base. And I'll shrink that a little just because it's uh, a bit excessive for such a simple situation. And if I unload or reload data sets, you'll see that they respond dynamically. Uh, I could also place a uh, second chart for adopting, maybe over here on the left. Or another thing I could do actually is switch to another nice tool, uh, which is the strip graph. Uh, so a strip graph, if I click customer base, gives you both a variable and its inputs. So I've got the customer base and adopting. Um, so actually that might be a little nicer way to do this. Uh, so I'm going to uh, select the graph tool again and click on this to modify it. And instead of the graph, I'm going to use the uh, causes strip. So causes are you know things that cause the behavior to change. It means the inputs. And close that. So now uh, I can see uh, see both of these. Um, oops. Again, undo is your friend. Uh, or actually, I guess in this case, I need the trash can. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's my chart. And you'll notice uh, the line for adopting is a little hard to see because it's pinned at the top of the chart. But if I hover over it, it's accented for me. And again, I can turn elements on and off. Okay, in a moment here we want to add an outflow to the customer base so we can start having some more interesting dynamics. But before we do, uh, let's think about this for a moment. Because in a way, something remarkable is happening here. We have an input of adopting, which is constant, and yet our customer base is not constant. It's a ramp. 
And that's because of the dynamics of accumulation. The customer base is integrating the adopting. And that actually has quite a profound implication for the causality here, which is that the outcome, the, uh, the customer base, is not correlated with the input of adopting. In fact, formally, the correlation coefficient here would be undefined because adopting isn't changing at all. Um, and yet we know that adopting influences the customer base. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons that we're fond of saying that correlation doesn't apply, uh, correlation does not imply causation, but also lack of correlation does not imply lack of causation because here we know it's causal and yet correlation is problematic. Um, and this kind of very simple accumulation dynamic fools people all the time because they're expecting to see the same pattern downstream in the customer base as they saw upstream in adopting and yet the patterns are different in a qualitative way. So uh, now we're going to add a, uh, an outflow. Um, we'll call it uh, dropout rate or dropping out, depending on the convention you've chosen. Uh, and the idea is that um, people only keep the product for so long. The car breaks down, the printer breaks down or runs out of ink, phone becomes obsolete something like that. So the product has some finite lifetime and over that lifetime there's a, uh, a chance at each point in time that a person will leave because they've dropped the product. Um, so let's uh, create that structure. Um, and actually, I put my uh, plot on the wrong side here because it's kind of in the way. So I'm just going to move that over to the other side uh, before I do it. And I'm now going to create an outflow. So to create an outflow, I grab the flow tool again and I click inside the stock. And now wherever I click in the white space, I'll get my cloud and the connecting arrow. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we'll call it uh, dropping out. And actually, before I get too far, I'm going to save another edition here. I'll call this uh, customers one. Um, and actually, this is a habit even in uh, professional contexts that we tend to preserve. If we're not using source control, it's very helpful to keep multiple version numbers of your model so that you can later compare them and backtrack. Um, source control like Git or Subversion also does that for you. Okay, so we have uh, dropping out. And we know the number of people who drop out is partly a function of how big the customer base is to begin with. And I went a little fast there, so I'm just going to do that again. I'm going to grab the arrow tool. This is not a flow arrow. It's an information arrow indicating that customer base influences the number of dropouts. Uh, and again, I'm going to undo one more time. Control Z. And do that again. You can click on customer base and then click on dropping out to make a straight arrow. But usually we want something that's a little bit loopy. So if you click in the white space, it adds an anchor for you. And then you get a nice uh, curve. Um, so uh, the rate at which people are dropping out depends on the customer base. But it also depends on some parameter that indicates how fast they're going to drop out. Uh, and there are actually two equivalent ways to do that. So I'm going to create a parameter here. I could call this the, say, the uh, fractional dropout rate. 
in which case it would mean what fraction of customers drop out each month. Um, or I could call it the uh, product lifetime or maybe the customer residence time or something. Um, the difference is the unit. Uh, so the product lifetime is going to be in months. So uh, if I go this route, I'm going to be saying that the number of dropouts is the customer base divided by the product lifetime. So if we had 100 customers and the product lasts 10 months, we'd have 10 customers per month drop out, 100 divided by 10. Um, and we want to confirm that the units match up. Uh, so again, thinking about this, the customer base is people, and this is months, and this is people per month. So that gives us a pretty good hint of what equation we want here. Uh, so let's grab the equation tool and write these. So when I select that, first you'll notice the customer base is highlighted again, and that's because I've added a flow. So it wants me to uh, essentially check its work. So you'll see here it's added uh, dropping or subtracted dropping out in the integration uh, in the dynamics, and that's a good thing. Uh, you'll notice it's also updated the uh, list of uh, I shouldn't have overwritten that. It's updated the list of variables uh, that can be used in this equation. And our initial value can still be zero. Uh, so we're okay there. So now the number dropping out will be the customer base divided by the product lifetime. And that will be in units of people per month. Um, so finally, how long does the product last? Let's say 24 months. And uh, actually, I don't have months here yet, so I'm going to say months. And hit OK. All right, so uh, now we have... Um, uh, runnable model again, I hope. I'll hit save. Let's check our units. And we have a units error. Uh, so each unit error tells you the equation. And then it tells you what the inputs and the outputs are and the units that are listed for those. Um, and uh, the problem is that the equations are expecting people per month and it's producing people per month. Well, that's actually sort of silly. Month and months are obviously equivalent. So what we probably want to do here is go to the model menu to the settings and uh, we can modify the units here. Uh, so Actually, often you'll have a default list of equivalents. Mine's just not set up with that. Um, so if I edit this first line here, I can tell it, or create a new line, I guess. I can tell it that month and months are equivalent. And sometimes it's nice to have the uh, abbreviations like MO for month. Um, okay, now if I check units again, they're okay. Um, so, so far, uh, units checking isn't really uh, doing much for us, um, but the Mars Climate Orbiter or the Mars Polar Orbiter, I don't remember which one, ended up hitting the planet at orbital speeds because uh, one contractor used English units and the other used metric units. So units are clearly important in that case to the tune of a billion dollars or so. Um, so uh, what if we had made a real mistake here? So for example, in our equation for dropping out, we might have written instead of dividing by product lifetime, we could forget and multiply. 
uh, and the units checking will catch that. So uh, here it tells us that it's expecting units of people per month, but it's getting month people. Um, so that's a real conceptual problem in the model, and it would probably wreck the behavior by making the dropouts 100 times too fast. Uh, so this is a case where the formal check is crucial for ensuring the integrity of the model. Um, okay, I'll save. Uh, one other thing to note here is dropping out has now been added to the uh, um, uh, strip graph, and but it doesn't have any data yet because we haven't run the model. So I'm going to give this a new name, uh, call it customer1, and we'll run it in a moment. Um, but what do we think this is going to do? That's actually a question you should be asking yourself all the time. What do I think this is going to do? Uh, because if you just run the model and look at the output, you can rationalize all sorts of crazy stuff. If you actually write down what your expectations are, uh, you may learn something. Either you'll learn that the model is wrong because it did something surprising that turned out to be an error, or uh, you'll learn that your mental model was wrong because you correctly described formally what you thought was the way the world worked, and the structure of the model didn't produce that same behavior, meaning there's some feature missing in your mental model uh, or some feedback loop is reversed or something. Um, okay, uh, so what do we think is going to happen? Well, adopting is still 100 people. Uh, customer base still starts at zero. So we know that we're still going to be starting in this uh, uh, zero corner of the customer base plot. Uh, and we also know that if customer base is zero, dropouts are initially going to be zero. Um, so we could reason that adopting is initially going to start filling up the customer base. So we're going to start on this same slope as before. Uh, but what's going to happen? Well, as we uh, start building up a customer base, we're going to get more and more dropouts. Um, so formerly, where we had no outflow here, we're going to have now an outflow, which means the customer base has to level off somewhere below the blue line. Um, so, uh, well, of course, it doesn't have to do anything in particular, but that's, uh, that's my guess. So let's try it. And rather than, well, I'm just going to do a ballistic run here. I'm going to run a single simulation by hitting the green triangle again. Um, and, uh, there it is. It's the blue line. The colors shifted because I'm loading data sets at the beginning. Um, I could uh, shuffle this new one down and that'll uh, reshuffle the colors. Um, well, uh, so customer one levels off at about uh, 20, just short of 2,400 people. Um, Whereas customer zero and the adopting 200 runs just kept growing forever. Let me get rid of adopting 200 because that was a different parameter or a different value for adopting. So I'm just going to unload that run. Uh, so now we can see what's going on. So actually, at starting at around time zero, these started at very nearly the same slope. I could actually zoom in on the chart here to see that. Uh, so it's really the same. And then if you drag up and to the left, it'll actually reset the scale. Um, so they start at the same slope, and yet this one levels off. So leveling off, arriving at a constant value we call coming into equilibrium. So 
what's happening here? Uh, ponder that for a moment. So if you look at the structure here, for the customer base to be constant, the inflow of adopting 100 people has to be matched by an outflow of dropping out of 100 people per month. Um, so when does that happen? Well, if the product lifetime is 24 months, then you get 100 out when you have 2,400 people here. So a customer base of 2,400 roughly corresponds with a dropout rate or dropping out of about 100, and you'll see it's approaching that here. Uh, so that's where we get equilibrium in this case. Uh, and you'll notice at that point that the number of people in the customer base is essentially uh, a product lifetime of the inflow. So the inflow is 100 people per month times 24 months is 2,400 people. So uh, that's where we end up in equilibrium. Um, something else to notice here is that at 24 months, roughly, we're about uh, two-thirds of the way to equilibrium. And at 48 months, uh, we are... 85% of the way to equilibrium. And at 72 months, we're 95% of the way to equilibrium. Um, so if you refer to the product lifetime as the, the time constant of this process that is draining customers out, uh, at the rule of thumb is that at three time constants, you're 95% of the way to equilibrium in a simple system like this. Um, thinking about the feedback here, uh, we could label this. Uh, so we have, uh, as customers go up, dropouts go up. So we could label this arrow with a uh, plus polarity. Um, and then as dropouts go up, all else equal, the customer base goes down because dropouts are draining. So we could label this flow pipe here with negative polarity. Um, oh, and I should put that at the handle because it put it in the wrong place. Uh, so I'm going to put this on the handle. There we go. And uh, if we really want to emphasize this loop, we could also uh, put a marker on it to indicate that this is a negative feedback loop. Uh, so I'm going to grab the comment tool and click in the middle here. And rather than writing a text comment, uh, well, actually I could. I can label this uh, um, B1, B for balancing. So this is a balancing loop. And uh, I can also uh, give it a, a, uh, an icon. I could give it a negative icon instead of that label. Or I can give it the shape of a uh, loop. In this case, it's a counterclockwise loop. Um, and it's a little big by default, but if I shrink that... Uh, there we go. And uh, apparently I made the loop go the wrong way. There we go. Uh, so this is helpful if you're writing a paper about a model that has multiple uh, uh, feedback loops in it and you want to identify them, even if you're just doing causal loop diagramming. Uh, if you refer to them as you know B1, B2, B3, R1, R2, R3 for the reinforcing loops, then you can easily refer to them in the text of your paper, uh, identifying what you're seeing on the diagram. Now that the model's a little more interesting, let's experiment a little bit more. I'm gonna turn on what's called Synthesim mode, which is the second green play button in the uh, toolbar. And what that does is 
turns on the model live uh, and I'll just go ahead and leave the run name at customer one um, so that we can uh, play around with it. And you'll notice uh, when I hit that, I now have a slider on the constants in the model. So adopting is uh, a number between minus 100 and 200. That's a uh, default guess, so I can click on the slider here and adjust it. We probably don't want negative adoptions because that doesn't make sense. And if I check the copy min max increment to the model, uh, it will make this change permanent so that next time I start this up, the uh, sort of the interface will be upgraded. Um, so now I can play around with that. And as I change the adoption rate, essentially I change the initial slope of the customer base, but I don't change the behavior qualitatively. It's still always gradually rising to equilibrium. Uh, I can also play around with the product lifetime and uh, let me set adopting back to 100. Again, if you click on the slider track, you can type a number. Um, so if I play with product lifetime, notice as I make the lifetime really long, the behavior approaches the original behavior uh, because we're essentially making this feedback loop weak by making the dropout process very slow. In fact, I could click on this and I could set this to thousands of months, in which case there are essentially no dropouts. Now you can see the behavior in the red, the new trajectory is essentially the same as it was before we added that loop because products last for a million months. Um, another thing I could do, uh, I could try setting that to zero months. What does a zero month product lifetime mean? Well, that means uh, kind of infinitely fast dropouts. And you'll notice the red frame here uh, and the yellow warning bar indicating that there's a floating point error. And that's easy to see. If you look at the uh, equation for dropping out again, it's the customer base divided by the product lifetime. So now we're dividing by zero. Uh, which implies an infinity, which just doesn't make any sense in this context. So if I want to uh, kind of stabilize the situation, I should probably set the range on this slider so that the lifetime is at least a month. Uh, the, the lower bound would be determined by the time step for stability. So let's try that. And now one month product lifetime means the customer base equilibrates at an extremely low level of 100 people, but it's at least stable. And then as I make it longer, notice the shape of the curve gets flatter and flatter because it's taking longer to reach equilibrium. So if product lifetime is... 10 months from the rule of thumb, I expect to be at about 95% at 30 months, and that's right where we are. And if I make it, uh, let's make it 30 months. Now I expect to hit that 95% at 90 months, and there we are. Another way I can use Synthesim is by doing what we call an override. Uh, so an override, lets you uh, change the dynamics or replace the dynamics of the equation with some kind of test input. So uh, for example, on dropouts, I could over right click it or control click it, override the default behavior, uh, and I could uh, say replace the uh, value with a constant so that there's a constant inflow and a constant outflow. Uh, so it's a constant with a slider. So zero outflow, again, we're back to the original behavior of the first model. And then as we increase the outflow, we bring the 
rate of accumulation of customers down. And at some point, as soon as we exceed 100, so I'm at 101 here, you'll notice the number of customers goes to minus 76. That's not uh, good if the units are people. There's no such thing as nega people. Um, and that just gets worse. So obviously uh, a constant outflow would be a bad equation for this, or at least not robust to some conditions. Uh, so I might want to reset that to turn off that override. Another thing I could do is feed in various kinds of test inputs for adopting. So for example, if I override this, I could give it a uh, sine wave um, where I specify the uh, mean value and the period. Um, so here you'll notice uh, this is sort of interesting. Adopting has a very clear signal. I could even make this uh, a little bigger by making it go from 50 to 150. So now adopting has a pretty strong sort of seasonal behavior to it. Uh, if I wanted this to be literally seasonal, I suppose I could make this uh, 12 months. Um, and yet dropping out has a greatly attenuated seasonal signal, and so does the customer base. Um, that is because the period of the oscillation that we're feeding in is pretty short relative to the period of the product lifetime. If I make the lifetime longer and longer, I actually even attenuate those oscillations on the outflow more. And uh, similarly, if I were to make this short, let's say uh, I'm going to set it to three months. Now you see that the strong period on the inflow passes through to become a reasonably strong signal on the output. So this would be a fun thing to explore on your own. When I'm done, I can just close this window and stop the override, or in this case, I'm just going to stop the synthesim session uh, because we want to add a little more structure to the model. So I'm going to save customers one as it is. And then I'll do a save as again and uh, call it customers two. And I want to add a little bit more structure to create model B. So now we're going to start sort of expanding the dynamics back towards the market and consider not just what happens if we have constant adoptions, but if adoptions actually depend on our customer base through word of mouth. So what we're going to do is actually create two features. So the first is customers create contacts at some contact rate. So this is uh, people, and this is people contacted per person per time, uh, which gives you the number of contacts that happen each month between a customer and sort of somebody else in the universe. And then a certain fraction of those contacts succeed and produce a word of mouth adoption and that gets added into the adoption rate. And then the other piece that we need to kind of kickstart this process, remember there are no customers initially so there won't be any contacts and there won't be any word of mouth, uh, is some promotional adoption. So for example, give away uh, a thousand widgets of whatever sort we're talking about here in order to seed some additional customers who will then go out and show off their goods to other people and convince them to buy the product. Um, okay, so uh, this piece is going to be uh, actually somewhat similar to the dropout rate in a sense, uh, you know, where the pro one over the product lifetime is the fraction of people dropping out and the contact rate times the fruitfulness is the fraction of new customers attracted per existing customer per month. And then this piece, the promotional adoptions, we're probably not going to do it all the time. Um, so uh, 
actually we could do this as an override again, but we'll write an equation so we can play around with it more easily. Uh, this will be what we call a discrete event, which is something that happens just in one time slice in the uh, model. So let's switch back and build that structure. And while I'm thinking of it, I'll change the run name also. I'm just going to move this over to give myself a little more workspace. So uh, the first thing I have in my sort of whiteboard concept is that I have something like, called uh, contacts and a contact rate so the number of contacts depends on the number of customers and this rate uh, so contacts which is going to be people per month is the customer base times contact rate. And actually you'll notice I could type this equation, but I can just use the variable list here to insert variable names. Um, saves on typing and typos. So that should be okay. So now my contact rate. How many people does a person talk to in a month about their stuff? Well, that's pretty product specific, um, but I'm just going to assume that it's 10. So that's uh, people per person per month. Um, and you'll notice that uh, people per person essentially cancels out. Uh, so we could also write this as one over month which I'll do just to avoid having to create the equivalent of people in person. Um, okay, uh, so that gives me contacts. Let's just do a test run, see if the units check out and run it. So the number of contacts now follows the number of customers, so it's ending up at 2,400. Um, and actually, I'm gonna while I'm in here, I'm gonna lower the lifetime to uh, ten months. So a fairly transient product. That's just gonna make kind of doing the math in our head easier later on. Uh, let's run that again. Okay, that gets us a lower equilibrium of a thousand uh, customers, a hundred people times ten months. Um, so now we have need uh, word of mouth adoptions. And that depends on how successful those contacts are. So there's a, uh, let's call it, I called it uh, contact fruitfulness, or you might call it the contact success rate or success fraction. Um, we're always just looking for variable names with a nice positive sense that evoke what you're really talking about. And ideally, if you do that well, the model is pretty much self-documenting. You don't have to explain your equations because it's self-evident from the words that make them up. Um, so adopting now for the moment will consist of word of mouth adopting. We'll worry about the promo in a moment. Um, and word of mouth adopting is the number of contacts times the contact fruitfulness. And I know the units should be people per month, but, uh, one thing I can do, actually, I can hit the check units button to uh, guess from the right hand side. Oh, and that didn't, uh, didn't work here. So people per month. 
We may exclude that from PLE actually in order to uh, make uh, students think. Um, and contact fruitfulness. So this is the fraction of contacts that succeed. So fraction is kind of a syn synonym for a dimensionless number. So this has to be somewhere between zero and one. And actually, if I want it to have a nice range for a synthesim slider right off the bat, I can put zero and one in the min and max fields here uh, so that it doesn't have to guess. And let's just say it's 10% uh, or 0.1 as a, an initial parameter. Let's check our units again. And we'll run it. Aha. Uh, it's hard to see, but the customer base is stuck at zero. And actually, this is the problem I alluded to earlier on the slide, which is that there are no customers initially. So there are no contacts, no word of mouth, no adopting. So the system is kind of stuck in this trivial equilibrium where no one's interested in the product uh, and therefore there are no dynamics. So um, one thing we could do is we could initialize the customer base to a non-zero number and see what happens. Uh, another possibility is we add the promo. So let's do the promo. Now, uh, the promotional adoption equation involves a discrete event, as I mentioned. And there's actually a series of videos about modeling discrete events uh, in the library at vensim.com. Uh, but I'm going to cheat and just take a peek in my copy of the finished model. Uh, so we have the key equation is the promo adoption rate, which is a function of the promo size, which is how many products do we give away to begin with. So if I look at the equation for that, and I'm going to use the uh, document tool here uh, just to make it a little bigger. The promo adoption rate is the size multiplied by a function called pulse at time 10 with duration time step. So that just creates a spike of unit height at time 10, and it's only going to last for one time slice or one time step, which in this model is one month. And then I'm going to divide by time step, and that's to ensure that the entire promo size pulse flows into the stock in that one time step. So promo size is going to be people, and this has units of month or one over month because we're dividing. Uh, so let's implement that. Okay, back to my uh, working model. Um, so uh, I'm going to grab the variable tool again to create auxiliaries. So this is the uh, promo adopting, sticking to the same naming convention, and the promotion size. And I need uh, time step, but time step's a built-in variable. So what I can do is use the shadow variable tool here, which has brackets on either side of it to add that to the diagram. Uh, so that, that's an existing variable. And if I just scroll through the list here, I get time step and I add that. Uh, in Pro and DSS, I can just use it in the equation. It'll get added to the diagram, but PLE, uh, requires a little more care in constructing the diagram to support the equation. Uh, so the promo size and time step determine the promo adopting, and then the promo adopting is added to the word of math to get the total adopting. Uh, so now let's just uh, work backwards. So adopting is now word of mouth adopting plus promo adopting 
promo adopting is again people per month and it's the size of the promotion times the pulse function and if I've forgotten the arguments already I can actually just pick it out of the list here so pulse and you'll see in curly brackets are the argument names uh, so the start will be time 10 probably I should actually make this a named variable uh, so I can move the start around but I'm not going to worry about that for the moment and the duration is going to be time step and then finally this is all going to happen in one time step so that is promo adopting all I have to do is specify how big the promotion is uh, so this is people this is how many people get the uh, free phone or the free widget uh, so I'm gonna start with a hundred just because it's a nice round number and hit OK so this is now our second model or our actually our third model in a sense since we started with zero uh, let's check the units units are okay and run it and actually before I say yes to this what do we think is going to happen ponder that for a moment Ah, okay. Uh, so we now have uh, about 10 to the 25th people in our customer base. So just uh, among us, that's probably a bit much. Um, so what's happening here? Well, uh, there are various ways to debug this. One would be get the customer base and look at a strip graph, which is actually what we already have at the left pinned on the diagram. But in this case, actually, that's not very helpful because sort of everything is moving in wild exponential growth together. So all you see are these kind of hockey stick shapes. Uh, so a better way to look at this is probably with the table tool. Um, so let me pull that up and make it a little bigger here. Uh, so through, well, for the first 10 time steps, nothing happens because the promotions don't happen actually. So maybe the first thing we should do is verify our promo. Here's promotional adopting. So you can see it's zero, 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 then a spike of 100 people in a month and then drops back down to zero so that part works so it must be this new loop of word of mouth that's going bonkers uh, so let's scroll ahead to time 10 so you can see we have a hundred people in the customer base and then 190 and then 360 and 685 so it's nearly doubling every time step and of course, if you double 10 times, you have a thousand times as much stuff as you started with. Um, and here actually, if it's doubling every month and we're doing it for 90 months, uh, we're, we're really doubling in an extraordinary amount. So uh, that's why we're getting these numbers that exceed the... Uh, human population of known space. Um, so, uh, so clearly what's happening is this loop is just way too strong. Uh, so if you look at the number of adopting, uh, that's a hundred in the first month. Um, let's see. So, uh, well, the hundred, the first hundred is the promo. 
And then after that, we get another 100 from kind of the echo of the promo, and then 190, 360. Uh, so let's keep tracing here. Uh, now we want to know uh, what's the word of mouth. That should be the same. So there's our 100, 190, 360. Um, and the number of contacts is 1,000. So now I think we get a hint of what the problem is. is we've got... After, after the promo, we have 100 customers. The contact rate is 10. So those 100 customers contact 1,000 other people. And then because fruitfulness is 10% or 0.1, those 1,000 people yield another 100 adoptions. So uh, that's just way too high. So partly maybe people don't really talk to 10 other people about a product in a given month, uh, but probably also the, the fruitfulness is just way too high. Um, so let's try to bring this under control. Uh, maybe we can do this first in Synthesim to see what's reasonable. So I'm just going to start it up and uh, bring the fruitfulness down from, say, 0.1 to 0.01 and see what happens. Ah, okay. Uh, that's actually sort of interesting. Let, let me unload the uh, other experiments just so we can keep what we're looking at simple. So the customer base now jumps to 100 and just sits there. And you see the spike of 100 adoptions and then 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and 10 dropouts. So it seems that at 0.01, we've exactly hit the knife edge of stability between growth of the customers and decline of the customers. Uh, because we're losing 10% a month here, and we're gaining 10% a month here because there's 10 contacts and 1% of them are successful. So 0.1 net. So at least I would guess here that if we make fruitfulness just slightly stronger, we're going to see growth, and just slightly weaker, we're going to see decline. Uh, so let's try that. Let's just make it 0.011. Ah, and now you can see the more reasonable rate of growth here. That, this might still be too slow. And say, by the same token, we could do 0.009. And we'll see a slow decline. So the, this product didn't quite take off because we gave out the promos and the promo people didn't quite attract enough people to replace themselves when they dropped out. So more typical product dynamics, it's going to be kind of mildly to wildly successful, but limited by the human population. So let's try 0.02. So now you see pretty strong growth, but over, you know, not quite 10 years, we're reaching 600,000 people. So that's not uh, completely crazy. Um, you'll notice uh, as we change the promo size here, the, these charts are rescaling, but actually the, the dynamics kind of look the same at any scale that you look at them. So changing the promo size isn't changing this feedback loop, but changing the fruitfulness is making it stronger or weaker. So this model's now working okay, but it still has one undesirable property, uh, at least, which is that as we raise fruitfulness, at some point, the uh, and actually not a, not very far away, the number of uh, customers becomes enormous and that's because essentially uh, we're ignoring this cloud here uh, which um, really means you know in the real world people have to come from somewhere uh, so there actually should be a stock on the end of this chain representing the number of people who aren't in the customer base 
who are eligible to adopt this product. Uh, and that provides a constraint on word of mouth. So this somehow needs to depend on the availability of people in this cloud. And that's what the next model is about. Uh, and we're not going to build it just in the interest of time. So what we'll do is open an, a copy uh, out of the shared folder, out of the zip folder, and do a few experiments on it uh, because it also provides some interesting insight and a couple additional things we can do. I'll do one last save before I leave here and then I will open a copy of the uh, exercise saved in the zip folder that completes the structure. Uh, so in this version of the model, we now have a stock of potential customers and they are initialized to the total population minus anybody who is in the customer base or the former customers. And actually you'll notice there are a couple of uh, gray arrows here. These represent... Um, initialization relationships for the stocks rather than dynamic relationships like the rest of the blue arrows. Um, so we have a total population of 1 e to the 8, which is 100 million people, so sort of uh, vaguely the number of adults in the U.S. Um, and uh, there's now a new loop here, which is uh, if we have more potential customers, then the uh, fraction of contacts that occur that are with a potential customer uh, increases. And I'm going to resize that just to make it a little prettier. And that increases the word of mouth adoption rate and fuels adopting. But the way this loop actually works is essentially running the other way. So adopting drains potential customers. So fewer potential customers means fewer potential customers in the population that is getting contacted, which means less word of mouth adoption. Uh, so this loop here is and I could actually, if I wanted to present this, I could uh, emphasize this by changing the uh, arrow style or uh, actually what I should change is the arrow color, which I can do down here in the bottom toolbar. So this red process is the driving loop of word of mouth growth and then arresting that is this saturation process of running out of customers. Um, so uh, now we can kind of see a little bit better visually what's happening here. And uh, let's, uh, let's work with this a little bit uh, just to see how it behaves. And actually, uh, for a, a model like this, it's often nice to build yourself kind of a control panel. And we have the start of that here. We have uh, adopting and the customer base as pinned charts. Another thing we might want to see here is a plot of uh, adopting and discarding on the same axes as the customer base. So we can kind of see how the net flow of adopting minus discarding is growing the customer base. So one way to do that is with what we call a custom graph. So I'm going to bring up the control panel here and switch to the custom graphs tab. Uh, and actually you'll see that there is one built here of adopting and discarding. Uh, so I'm going to just double click that to bring it up and well in this case it's a little hard to see you can see adopting is the blue and discarding is the red and they're coming very quickly into equilibrium so we'll have to see what parameters are driving that 
um, uh, we could actually we could modify this I'm gonna click that and edit it and uh, You'll see these actually have use a keyword star one star two to show more than one data set if there is one, um, and I could uh, I could add one more variable to this list which is the customer base. Um, so I'm going to add the customer base here, and it's a little hard to see again because the dynamics are all the same. Um, but one key feature here is, you know, maybe this is a graph we shouldn't create, uh, is adopting is people per month, discarding is people per month. So it makes sense to put those on the same axis. Customer base is in people, different units. So we should not really compare those on the same axis. So what's happened here is I've left the scale inheritance checkbox unchecked which puts customer base on uh, on its own uh, scale. So you'll notice the left-hand scale is people per month and the right-hand scale is people. Um, so we'll go with that for the moment. And then we can pin that graph on the diagram. Again, I've grabbed the, uh, I've grabbed the uh, control tool with the uh, workbench graph. I'm gonna click here. And instead of a workbench tool, I'm gonna use a custom graph and then I can pick it from the menu. And uh, it's hanging just slightly off the screen, which kind of bugs me. So I'm gonna say uh, view fit to screen just to keep everything scaled onto the, uh, within the, the viewport. Um, Okay, uh, so now uh, we can play around in Synthesim. Um, I'm going to do a base run here. And uh, you can see the base run is again at this point of knife edge stability. If I look at the customer base, it's just rising to a thousand and sitting there. Uh, so what if I make the product lifetime twice as long, 20 months instead of 10? Now I have growth. And uh, what you can see is that adopting in blue is roughly twice as big as discarding in green. Um, I could also start increasing the success rate uh, and that's going to accelerate growth. But now you can see actually that as I, uh, if, as I make this higher and higher towards 10%, I no longer get the you know, trillions or quintillions of people that I had before. Uh, the customer base actually still peaks and declines. Uh, and adoption is limited, maxes out here at about 5 million. Um, and as I vary the success rate, I can kind of move that peak earlier and taller in time. Uh, but I can't make it go away entirely. And, and be careful you don't fool yourself because these charts do dynamically rescale at certain thresholds. So sometimes things get smaller when they're actually getting bigger um, unless you fix those scales. So... Uh, so now I can really see pretty well what's going on. So I'm going to reset the sliders back to the base. Uh, so now I can start creating uh, multiple scenarios. Um, let's uh, actually, I'm going to reinterpret base as being a uh, kind of mild growth. Um, so 5% success rate. And actually, that, that's sufficient here. Um, OK, so uh, that's my base. And I'm now going to do a uh, test run. And well, actually, let's, uh, let's give it a good name. Um, so let's call it Long Lifetime. So you'll notice 
I'm not stopping and starting the model. I'm just changing the name. And every time I change the name and then I move a slider, it's going to do a new run for me. Uh, so I'm going to now make the product lifetime 20 months instead of 10 months and see what that does. Ah, okay. Uh, so it gets me a little more growth up front and then a peak and then a slower decline in the customer base. Um, so that the slower decline kind of makes sense because we weakened this balancing loop that's draining customers out. Why do we get more growth? Well, it's because uh, we have sort of less erosion of the customer base during the period that this growth rate loop is operating. On the other hand, if you look at potential customers, you can see that you run out of them earlier. So because the product lasts longer, you sort of burn through the customers faster. Um, notably here, there's a stock on the other end of former customers and there's no recirculation. So this is kind of a fad product like a pet rock or something that people buy once and then after a while it's not fun anymore and they're on to the next thing. Um, a lot of real markets might have recirculation of former customers back into the potential customer stock uh, or they might have some other kind of repeat purchasing mechanism or kind of theft of customers by competitors and a variety of other dynamics. Um, so in any case, doubling the product lifetime changed the dynamics moderately but not strongly. Um, how about doubling the success rate? Um, so I'm going to bring that up to 0.1. Now you can see that that has quite a more dramatic effect. Oh, my product lifetime is still 20. I'm going to put that back to 10. So uh, that's fairly dramatic in that it makes the market peak much earlier. Um, and if you look at adopting, actually we can uh, use the strip graph to see what's happening here. you can really see the difference. So uh, the word of mouth adoptions peak uh, much earlier. And actually, if you notice the peak here, there's a bit of a corner. That kind of suggests that our time step might not be fine enough. We should probably change the time step to a quarter of a month or something. In fact, we can do that right here and just see um, I'll make it 0.125. Powers of 2 are nice because they minimize round off error. Um, now you can see the uh, peak in adoption and the customer base is a little smoother. So that's uh, probably an improvement in fidelity um, in this model, maybe not important. Uh, okay, so um, there's our uh, adopting. Actually, one other thing you can see is uh, that that makes our promo adoption rate look a lot bigger. It now goes to 8,000, but that's because we're pumping in 1,000 people in an eighth of a month. So the instantaneous rate is 8,000 people per month, but it only lasts for an eighth of a month. Um, so uh, the... It's interesting that the response to these parameters is not uniform. Doubling the product lifetime gave us kind of a mild increase in growth and a change in the right tail of the decline of customers, um, whereas the doubling the success rate gave us this really dramatic increase in growth. But ultimately, the outcome is still the same of running out of customers because there's no replenishment in the market. Uh, there's one more thing we could try, which is uh, more promo adoptions. So let me do a run 
called more promo and I'll reset all the other sliders back to the uh, base case. So more promo should initially be uh, like the uh, base case. Um, oh yeah, we're back to uh, flat. So actually if there's no growth in the market, uh, it's too flat. Uh, so let's see, what else did I change? Is it simply doubling? No. Uh, oh, uh, my base case, I think, has uh, 5%. Yeah, 5% success rate. 0.05. Um, okay, so now more promo is the same as my base case. What I'm trying to do here is be scientific and change only one thing at a time. Um, so what's going to happen if we double the size of the promotions? Um can't have negative promotions. So if we go from 1,000 to 2,000, is it going to look more like the red curve of the high success rate or more like the gray curve of the long lifetime? Think about that for a moment. And then let's do uh, the experiment. And of course, there's a third possibility, which is neither. So here's double promo. And this is actually pretty interesting. So uh, let's make a bigger graph so we can zoom in on that. So the more promo is the blue curve here. It looks exactly like the base case, except that it's shifted forward in time a little bit. Why would that be? Well, if you look at this promo size parameter, it doesn't affect any of the feedback loops. It just changes the essentially the initial condition of the customer base by putting twice as many people in there. So early in the market, the product is doubling every few months. Um, all we've done by doubling the initial promo size is move that forward in time. Um, and actually notably when success rate was 0.01, what we found was, uh, that more promo can't make a product that isn't going to grow naturally succeed. Uh, so if, again, if you, uh, blow this up to look at the customer base, even with double promo, if the product isn't attractive enough to drive that word of mouth process, then it doesn't sort of matter how much free stuff you throw at the market, it's just not going to take off. So even for this simple model, the dynamics start to be really interesting and there's a lot you can do to explore it uh, just by playing around in Synthesim and testing all the parameters. Uh, the last thing I'll uh, show you real quick is uh, there's a way to do them en masse, which is pick a variable like the customer base, click on sensitivity to all, and do a run. Uh, we'll give it a new name. Um, and it will generate a tornado chart for you indicating the strength of all of the parameters with respect to the target variable of interest that you selected. And then uh, once you generate that, um, it, actually you'll notice another interesting feature here, the contact and rate and success rate have the same effect because they are both multiplied together in the same feedback loop here. Uh, so they're symmetric, whereas the others uh, have somewhat different behaviors. Once you pick one, you can then simulate the plus or minus runs, or you can generate a set of uh, all graphs indicating the target behavior's sensitivity to those parameters. And this is a powerful way to kind of do a quick screening of the interesting properties or parameters of uh, even a fairly large model. So uh, we hope you have fun with that and uh, good luck with system dynamics. Thank you for coming.